kind of the user specific for the software company. The stock is uh, commercially supported by Bayer and uh, I'll start off here. So if you look at, uh, is my time 20 minutes or 15 minutes? Just give me the diagnosis of chronic kidney disease and uh, type 2 diabetes. What you can see is that if you have CKD with type 2 diabetes, you have an increased risk of getting myocardial infarction, heart failure, heart failure hospitalization and CV deaths. You can see that from the number of times they've been met. So, and if you look at the people with albuminuria, again you can see that if you have albuminuria, you are high likely to get going to dialysis, require inpatient hospital admissions or requirement of ER services. So it's like uh, basically saying that if you have either a reduced kidney function as evidenced by EGFR or have an elevated albumin in your urine, you run a risk of having many other diseases other than kidney disease. This is just a case history to just highlight the importance of chronic kidney disease in people with type 2 diabetes. This is a 58-year-old gentleman diagnosed with diabetes for 10 years. A1C is around 7.8. The blood pressure is slightly on the upper side. He's already on multiple medicines uh, on deliberate platform, then dapagliflozin, tervisat, and amlodipine, and atrovastatin. So from a medication perspective, he's been reasonably well taken care of, although not very optimal. The two things that we need to look at for a patient with type 2 diabetes when you assess the kidney function is, previously we always used to do a creatinine, but we also need to do a UACR, that is a urine albumin creatinine ratio. So once you do the creatinine, you can always calculate the EGFR and you can see where this patient is located. He is located at an EGFR of 60 ml per minute. Now you also need to look at the UACR of this patient. You can see that the person has got a UACR of 352 mg per gram, making him located at a different area. That means at a very high risk zone in terms of diabetes, kidney disease progression or the risk of having uh, hemodialysis or any other procedures in the future. It's also important to realize that this data from the RENA uh, to just show you that when you have more and more higher levels of albuminuria, it's not just kidney disease we are concerned about. So this is the first picture you can see that even after the first detection of significant albuminuria, there is an increased risk of CV composite outcome. That is having a risk of stroke, myocardial infarction or unstable angina or hospitalization for heart failure. And again, when you look at uh, the kidney composite outcome, you would realize that there is an increased risk of doubling of serum creatinine, end-stage renal disease or death. So basically, it's like saying that when you have an abnormia, you have an increased risk of kidney disease, you have an increased risk of various heart disease. So when you see abnormia, how, how, how much should the abnormia be before you start having an increased risk? So this is something which is uh, very important. So this is again some data to show that you can see the bottom x-axis and you can see the EGFR and UACR. Just have a look at the UACR and the arrow there. The odd post mortality increases when your UACR increases to 30. That means at the lowest level of detected UACR elevation, that is 30 is in your all your laboratory reports, 30 is the upper limit of normal, above 30 is abnormal. So even at a level of around 30, there is an increased risk of all cause mortality, showing that any albuminuria is important when you see a person. And previously, when you looked at the previous ADA guidelines, what we did is that we used to calculate UACR once or twice, or maybe to make a diagnosis two out of three times positive, you call a UACR as elevated. And then we leave it there. There, is, there was no role of looking after UACR again and again in our previous ADA guidelines. But from 2023, what has been said is that if your UACR is more than 300, you should aim to reduce UACR by at least 30% or greater to reduce the progression of chronic kidney disease. So it's now not only measuring UACR is important, you need to measure it again and again during the course of the patient's illness to see whether the therapies that you use are working well for the patient. Now coming to the therapy of chronic disease, uh, disease uh, kidney disease and CVD progression, we know that uh, there are different areas where we can interfere in terms of reducing kidney disease. One is the metabolic, the blue one, you can start from the blue one, metabolic, that you need to control your glucose 
well, then you have an improvement in your outcome for diabetic kidney disease. Hemodynamics, you need to control your blood pressure very strongly to reduce the risk of kidney disease progression. And when you use SGLT2 inhibitors, you have reduced, you also reduce the intraglomerular pressure. That is also a hemodynamic mechanism to reduce progression of kidney disease. But what we are interested now in speaking about in this lecture is inflammation and fibrosis. So now you have molecules like phenylalanine, which interferes with the third pathway, that is the inflammation and fibrosis, because irrespective of whether your hemodynamics is causing the problem or metabolic abnormality is causing the problem, the final end result in terms of nephron, nephron destruction is inflammation and fibrosis. So this is, now we have therapies to look at all different aspects. Now taking it one more step further, we know that all the other three things I told you, RAS inhibitors for reducing uh, RAS inhibitors or anti hypertensives can be there, SGLT inhibitors, phenylalanine there. Now we have even had GLP-1 RAS. We know that the study, the flow trial is out. In fact, I think it came in two or three days back as a print journal. So again showing that GLP-1 RAS also can retard the progression of chronic kidney disease. Now coming to the next part, that is the phenylalanine. Phenylalanine is something like aldosterone or epilinolone, which we have, but it is a non-steroidal molecule. It acts on the mineral corticoid receptor and it acts on both the inflammation and fibrosis and also the hemodynamic factors because we know that it has got an effect in terms of mineral corticoids can cause vasoconstriction, this can cause vasodilatation when you block it. And as I told you in the previous picture, uh, the inflammation and fibrosis is not only happening in kidneys, it's also happening in the heart. And when you have phenylalanine, you have both the areas getting product. Now, phenylalanine has been extensively investigated, but I think it has never been discussed that much. If you look at the different programs like renal, the DACE inhibitor, that's ARB, INDT is the Rubisartan trial, Credence is the Canaglifosin trial, DAPA, CKD, EMPA, EMPA, kidney outcomes trial. If you look at all these trials, the maximum number of patients studied in any development program is the phenylalanine program, where you have an approximately 13, uh, 14,000, 13,000 odd patients being studied in the clinical trial. So it's been extensively studied molecule. Two large clinical trials are there. One is called the Fidelio DKD trial. Another one is called the Figaro DKD trial. I'm not going into too much details of any of these trials, only to tell you that the Fidelio DKD looked primarily at late stage chronic kidney disease, and it looked whether Phenylalanine can reduce the risk of kidney disease progression. And secondary outcome was cardio, cardiovascular disease progression. Figaro DKD is just the opposite. It looked at people with early stage CKD to see whether phenylalanine can reduce the progression of heart disease primarily and kidney disease at a secondary endpoint. So these are the two trials. These trials were conducted in such a way there is a fidelity analysis that is the pooled analysis of both the Figaro and Fidelio trials put together. The advantage of such an analysis is that you are covering a large area of the spectrum of chronic kidney disease, which includes these two areas, the one marked areas. So an extensive number, amount of patients at high risk of diabetic kidney disease progression has been covered in these two trials. So our patient fits into this particular area of the heat map. Now, the composite outcome with the CV composite is there, the renal composite is there. I'm not reading it because these are common things which always we discuss about. So group of patients studies are studied are type 2 diabetes, CKD, already on RAS inhibitors, and serum potassium less than 4.8. If you look at the group of patients studied in this program, you can see that average age is around 65 years. The systolic and diastolic DPs are fairly well controlled. You can see that 137-76. Duration of diabetes is 15 years, very long duration of diabetes. Around 50% of patients had cardiovascular disease. And if you look at the therapies these patients are on, you can see, see that most they are reasonably optimized. Around statins in around 72% of patients, RAS in around 100% of patients. And you can see that these are not people who are having minor kidney disease. At a diuretic use, you can see 50% were on data diuretics. For kidney disease person to be on a diuretic, that means it's a significant fluid retention also is happening. So these are higher risk patients being studied. One small issue is that if you look at the SGLT2 use in the population, it is very less, 6.7, because these trials were done at a stage where SGLT2s were not acceptable, means the acceptability or usage of SGLT2 in the market were not that high. That is why SGLT2 is less. Now if you look at baseline, you can see that 40% of patients had albuminuric CKD, 
will preserve kidney function. That means either even if you are in the late stage of kidney disease progression or in the early stage of kidney disease progression, both these groups of patients have been studied. Looking at the composite outcomes, these are the kidney outcomes. You can see that time to kidney failure sustained 57% reduction in EGFR, which basically means that doubling of creatinine. What, how much time will it take to double the creatinine or renal death? So these are the outcomes which have been studied in the Fidelity, the entire program as such. And you can see that the blue line is phenolanone. People who have been exposed to phenolanone have a reduced risk of going into kidney disease progression over a period of 48 months, that is around uh, four years study duration. Almost a 20 percentage risk reduction. Now coming to cardiovascular events with phenolanone, again you can see that there is a reduction in time to CV death, non-fatal MI, non-fatal stroke or hospitalization due to heart failure. Everything has been reduced significantly by phenolanone to the range of around 14 percentage for mor 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 morbidity, mortality <coughs> and heart failure hospitalization by around 22 percent. So significant cardiovascular and renal benefits. Just to put that in uh, different perspective, <coughs> important to realize that this has got a significant benefit in heart failure. There are ongoing committed heart failure trials. I think the results will be out in a few months or few years from now. Then you can see whether it will come as a heart failure recommendation. But even now, in the European Society of Cardiology 2023 guidelines, prevention of heart failure recommendation it says that phenomenon can be used in patients with CKD and type 2 diabetes to reduce the risk of hospitalization for heart failure. So even in this specific area, phenomenon has been found to be benefit, along with SGLT2 inhibitors, which is now well established in heart failure. Indication in India, CKD and type 2 diabetes patients to reduce the following things, EGFR decline, end-stage kidney disease, CV death, non-fatal MI, and hospitalization for heart failure. If you look at the, all the new recommendations by American Diabetes Association or by, by European Society of Diabetes or KDGO, every organization has now accepted non-steroidal MRA as a pillar of managing CKD. Now, we are concerned about the safety concerns regarding the molecule because we know that we have been using spironolactone for a very long time now and hyperkalemia is one of the major adverse effects of spironolactone. So the first and the most important thing everyone is interested in is the adverse effect profile of phenolanone. So if you look at the, the, the left, the right side of the picture, you can see that any hyperkalemia was more in phenolanone, that is 14 percentage in comparison to 6.9 percentage in the placebo arm. But if you look at hyperkalemia leading on to permanent discontinuation of the molecule, I'll come to the area for management hyperkalemia. Um, one of the previous speakers also had shown a very beautiful diagram on this. So significant hyperkalemia requiring stoppage of drug is only around 1.7 percentage. No hyperkalemia leading on to death has been seen in any of the studies. Other benefits of phenolanone include uh, uh, other, other adverse effects of phenolanone which were of concern but not raised include acute kidney injury which was not increased in phenolanone. Blood pressure reduction, you can see slightly good blood pressure reduction with phenolanone. Gynecomastia has been an important concern with spironolactone that is not seen because it's a non-steroidal uh, drug. Now, what, how can you practically use phenolanone? You start it for people with USCR more than 30, provided that the potassium is less than 5, and the EGFR should be more than 25. So this is the essential criteria to start phenolanone. If the EGFR is between 25 and 60, you can start at 10 mg per day. If it is more than 60, you can start at 20 mg per day. Then after one month of 10 mg, you can check the potassium and increase the dose to 20 mg. Maintenance more monitoring. Generally, you monitor every three months once the patient is stable. If potassium is below 5.5, you can continue the same dose. You can keep on continuing the drug till the EGFR is less than 15. And discontinue the drug if the EGFR is less than 15 or potassium is more than 5.5. You could always consider reintroducing the drug if the potassium is the reason for stopping the drug. And again, recheck and then decide whether to continue 
the drug or not. We have seen occasional patients having hyperkalemia, stopping drug, restarting and continuing without any problem. Certain uh, rule of fives, I think if you are interested in things like uh, rule of thumb and rule of threes and all those things, this is something uh, which the company has made. So initiate, uh, but if you only potassium is less than five, hold if the potassium is more than 5.5, start only if the EGFR is more than 25, and when it comes to outcomes, risk of kidney disease reduced by one fifth, and heart failure by again by one fifth. Now again, just to summarize the entire thing which I told, type 2 diabetes, CKD with diabetes is the group of patients to start or not. EGFR should be more than or equal to 25. USCR should be more than 30. Potassium should be less than 5. Patients should be on optimum AC inhibitors or ARP. When you say AC inhibitors or like Ramipril or ARPs like Telbisartan, most of the studies or rather all of the studies had one of these drugs as a background therapy before starting it or not. If it, EGFR is more than 60, start at 20. If it is less than 60 and more than 25, start at 10 milligram. So before I end, I am announcing our conference which is coming on 26th and 27th October in Trivandrum itself. Please do come. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nadijan. That is a excellent